You're watching CTV News Channel. I'm Todd Vander Hayden. Culture Shock Time, where we dig deeper into stories that are trending, getting buzz, headlines people are talking about, and a dramatic decision by Starbucks. The coffee juggernaut is going to close about 8,000 of its stores in the U.S. for the entire afternoon on May the 29th. It's a move that's going to cost Starbucks millions of dollars. The goal is racial sensitivity training. It comes after the company is trying to cool tensions following this incident that happened at one of its stores in Philadelphia. Two black men arrested for refusing to leave the Starbucks. They were sitting in the store. They didn't order anything, so an employee called the police who arrived and handcuffed the man, in fact. Let's bring in our culture shockers who are standing by. In Toronto, we've got Samantha Kemp-Jackson. In Calgary, we've got Mike Morrison standing by. And in Montreal, we've got Kenny Bodanis. Samantha, welcome to the panel. I'm going to start with you on this one. First of all, would this have happened if those two men were white? I would have to say absolutely not, Todd. I have seen so many people sitting in Starbucks who are not black, who are never asked why they're there. The police are never called. And I think this whole situation is appalling. If this is not racial profiling, I don't know what is. There are some great questions here, Mike, and let me get your read on this. Uh, what you make of the story? A lot of people watch this video. It's been seen millions and millions of times. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not as if these people were sitting in the Starbucks for hours and hours on ends. Uh, in, in a Good Morning America interview this morning, they were in the store for two minutes before the police were called. And so absolutely uh, racial profiling. I do find it interesting how Starbucks is handling this. I mean, I can't imagine a better way for a giant company like this, you know, to shut their stores down. I guess maybe if they shut them down in the morning when they would make a lot more money. But I mean, it, it, it's a good conversation to have for sure. It does raise an interesting question as well, Kenny, because I think we've all been in coffee stores where people do come in sometimes. They don't order anything. They take up a table. They use the mm -hmm. Wi-Fi free, blah, blah, blah. But what we're saying here is different because they were only in that store for a couple of minutes. Uh, it, Starbucks is a business. It's not a charity. So they're there to make money, of course. Right. But uh, can we really take race out of this story? No, I think it's impossible. There's a Starbucks near me, right near where my kids have music lessons. Their music lesson is 45 minutes. I love to go in either myself or with my wife to sit down, but there are never any tables. Why? Because everybody has been uh, sipping on their coffee for two hours and sitting at a laptop. And they're all white and nobody's getting arrested for it. One way I think Starbucks could improve on their handling, although I think this is a brilliant PR move because they have nothing to lose, but the employees, I don't know what a lifespan of an employee is. Uh, as far as their work goes at Starbucks, they'll probably be in and out within a couple of years, so the next crop won't have gotten this training, is make the training public. Do it an online symposium. So everybody, anywhere in the world with internet, can click on it and watch the training that the Starbucks employees are given. I say pay it for it and let everybody get a little bit of sensitivity training, not the least of which will be the police department in that area. Every time, Samantha, we see these stories uh, in the United States play out, and let's be honest, it does happen in Canada too, uh, but we sort of say this really seems to be part of a much larger pattern, whether it's racial profiling by police uh, in, in more dangerous situations. Now we have this cafe. Uh, what about the way Starbucks is handling this now? Uh, when we hear we're going to close our stores for racial sensitivity training, what does that actually mean, do you think? I'm not sure what it means, but I do have to applaud Starbucks for at least taking the step, Todd, to do something. The CEO was quite contrite, and I, from what I understand, he has spoken to the two gentlemen that were victims in this situation. I'm glad they're doing the training, but I think that it's just a first step. I think there's a long way to go, because when you think about it, as, um, as, uh, as we had mentioned previously, two minutes in a Starbucks and the police are called. How many people watching this program have been in a Starbucks for five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes? Perhaps you've just gone into the Starbucks and said, hey, I need to use the bathroom. Or perhaps you haven't even given an indication to the barista that you're going to use a bathroom. You've just assumed that it's okay that you have. But these two gentlemen waiting for a colleague for a business meeting are profiled. So we're at the beginning stages of, of sensitivity training for Starbucks, and that's great, but there's a lot more to be done. Yeah, great points raised by all. Okay, let's go from what's happening in Philadelphia to Sydney, Nova Scotia here in our country. Bit of a bizarre story that involves volunteerism getting some bad headlines. So here's the backstory. Volunteers for next year's Scotty's Curling Tournament are being required to actually pay a $100 so-called commitment fee. These are volunteers, remember. Organizers say that $100 will cover things like uniforms and even a dinner party. But again, you're paying to be a volunteer. Mike, let me start with you on this. What do you make of it? 
I think it's very, very silly. Um, volunteers are the most valuable resource any event has. Uh, events should welcome them with open arms. And I get that there's costs to having volunteers, but your event is happening and your event is successful because of volunteers. All right, I'm just going to jump in here, Mike, because we've got to go to a live event happening right now. Christia Freeland is speaking in Washington, our trade uh, point person on the NAFTA file. Let's just listen in here for a moment. Speaking for Canada, uh, our negotiators, our government, we are working very, very hard. This is a very intense period. Uh, we're rolling up our sleeves and we're really committed. Je vais au Lima, j'étais avec le Premier ministre. Il a eu des bonnes conversations avec le vice-président Monsieur Pence et avec le président du La Mexique. Uh, Senor Peña. Uh, après ces conversations, nous avons décidé tous les trois pays uh, que c'est un moment important pour les ministres du Canada, uh, de la Mexique, des États-Unis, d'avoir une rencontre. Uh, All right, so we're just listening in here as Christian Freeland uh, answers some brief questions here Europe in Washington. Let's listen in here again. With uh, Mexico and the United States and uh, meetings, uh, more uh, trilateral meetings as well. It's a moment uh, that is really uh, intensive for our negotiations on NAFTA, and we're working really hard. And, and our negotiators are working really hard. They're here. And uh, our uh, job continues, and it is to uh, to work uh, till the end. USTR was looking to have some sort of deal within three weeks. How realistic is that? You know what Canada has said all along is that we are very committed to a modernized NAFTA. We think that that is something that is great for Canadians and really good for the people of all three NAFTA countries. And from the outset, we have been committed to getting a win-win-win outcome and to working very hard to achieve that since, uh, you know, this year, and particularly in March, when we had some creative ideas from the U.S. on rules of origin, which really is the heart of this negotiation, fiendishly complicated, very important to get right. We had some creative proposals from the U.S. last month, and that has really opened up a path for us to move forward. We have been engaged very intensively since then. We continue to be working very, very hard. As you see, I'm here now. I was here less than two weeks ago, uh, and we're just working very, very hard. Our commitment is to get a really good win-win-win outcome as quickly as possible, and we're, we'll get the deal. You know, we'll work as long as it takes to get a great deal that works for everyone. But the three-week timeline, is that realistic? As I said, we are very committed to an intense engagement, and that is what you see manifest right now. Um, we are throwing all the resources we can, starting with the Prime Minister, at this negotiation. And it'll take as long as it takes to get a great deal. That's our commitment to Canadians. Can you so, talk so so much about content? So can I ask you just about form? Uh, have you decided what the new oh. agreement is going to? Have you decided on a name for this new agreement? Is it going to be called NAFTA? And the second one, uh, second question I had for you is um, the uh, whether you've decided on a mechanism for this agreement. Uh, what's going to be announced soon? Is it going to be a full agreement? Is it going to be uh, uh, something that can be done by executive order, et cetera, et cetera? At this point, our focus is very much on the issues on getting the issues right, um, on reaching an agreement between the three countries on what is going to be in this modernized NAFTA. I can tell you that we have had a lot of focus today, as we did the last time ministers met, uh, on the rules of origin for autos. Um, I believe very strongly, and I think this is a view shared by the two other countries, that rules of origin for autos, the highly integrated automotive sector is really at the heart of the NAFTA negotiation. And if we can get that right, um, that will be the core of a successful agreement and negotiation. Uh, and I again want to say, you know, the U.S. came forward with some creative ideas in the middle of early March, and that has really opened the door, opened a path forward for us. On rules of origin, it's important for people to appreciate this is a fiendishly complex set of issues. And I think all three countries are committed to coming up with something where the ideas are strong 
and where the details are right and workable. And I do want to also thank all the industry stakeholders, very much including labor, for the really hard work that they are doing together with our negotiators. Will you continue to meet with your, uh, your counterparts tomorrow? And can you confirm whether you've closed an additional chapter with telecom? Uh, we do, we will continue to meet tomorrow. Uh, I'm not going to share details right now on chapters that are being closed, but we'll get that information to you. And that is simply because I want to be sure that we're sharing information in a synchronized way with uh, the U.S. and Mexico. Is the, is the Mexican wage issue still the, the stumbling block? I mean, a couple of weeks ago, that was sort of the getting Mexico on board with that seemed to be the toughest thing, the auto wage thing. Is that still is that still the case or, or is Mexico coming around? You know, wages? as you know, Adrian, my feeling, my view at this stage is it's important to be negotiating at the negotiating table. Uh, we need to have a level of trust with the two other parties in NAFTA that they can feel that they can speak to us uh, at the table. So I'm not going to go into the details of any of the issues today. I will say that we have been making good progress uh, on the rules of origin in our conversations with the U.S., with Mexico, and in our trilateral conversation. It is, com rules of origin are very, very complicated. I think uh, Canadian focus right now is on being sure that we get the details right, being sure we come up with an outcome that is actually workable for our companies, including for car parts manufacturers, an outcome that cuts red tape, an outcome that is encouraging of innovation. So that is really our focus on rules of origin, and, and I feel we're making Good progress. Did okay. you talk to Charlie uh, today? You, we saw you were we'll talking. What, 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 All right, so listening to a little bit of Christia Freeland, our country's point person, when it comes to uh, the NAFTA renegotiations there in Washington, this ongoing saga, of course, that began eight, nine months ago or so, and we may be closer to a deal, possibly in May, but much of it depends on the willingness of the United States to compromise. Christia Freeland back in the U.S. Capitol in order to meet with her Mexican and American counterparts there. Uh, a lot of incremental items there. Christia Freeland saying she's hopeful hopeful on a number of different fronts, but of course, it's not done until it is actually done. Let's get back to our culture shock panel. They're standing by patiently waiting and to get back on this topic. We were talking before about the situation in Nova Scotia and this whole volunteerism thing, and I want to uh, throw the ball to Kenny Bodanis in Montreal. Kenny, this is a bit of a weird story. What do you make? Volunteers asked to pay $100, volunteers to be a part of this whole Scotty's curling event. You know what? I, I'm all for it. My first reaction when I read this was, hmm, let's say I pay 100 bucks, I get a uniform, I get a dinner, I have to work three to four hours a day over nine days, I have access to all the events, which normally goes for more than three or four times that. Thinking, I like curling, I love the Maritimes, I actually started thinking this might be a little vacation for me. It's, I see nothing wrong, they are getting perks, they're getting access to the events, they're getting dinners, they're getting a uniform. And I do also think there's something to be said for it creates a commitment in the volunteers. Being a volunteer myself on a local level at my kid's school, there are people who drop off the radar because they're just volunteering and listen, I said I could do it, but now I can't do it, things come up, I'm not being paid for my time, I have to prioritize, and it is a way to say, you know what, I'm putting in my money, you can pretty much guarantee I'm not gonna let you down. I have no problem with it whatsoever. Samantha, what about you? Well, I have a problem with it. <laughs> I, I hate to be the one uh, to say no, but I would have to say no, because I think that just by definition, you're a volunteer. You're already giving up some of your time. You're already giving part of yourself. And I'm sure that there are ancillary out-of-pocket costs that come up with being a volunteer already. Then to over and above ask these volunteers to pay another $100, yes, they get access, and yes, they get a uniform, but are they going to wear the uniform anywhere else? And the access is over, I think... Uh, nine days well that's you know that's only a short period of time i'm against the the uh, payment by volunteers to volunteer uh and i think it's going to be a backlash for them all right last one has to do with men and makeup the wall street journal reporting that men are wearing more makeup than we think david beckham for example soccer star has got a new grooming line but it seems that more and more customers men are putting makeup on of course i have to wear it for work but uh let me start with you on this one kenny bodan what do you think? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm all for if, if you want to do something that makes you feel good about you 
then hallelujah, go for it. If it's not hurting anybody else, my concern is, and I don't know if I'm overthinking this, is we're trending in such a direction now where people are so concerned about the portrait they put forward to the outside world while their insecurity for themselves builds in their real world alone. You know, even the journalist who wrote it said, I look like a Photoshop version of myself when I had makeup on it. Isn't that what we're trying to discourage? I knew so many women who, when I watched them put on makeup, I go, wow, you know, why are you bothering? And the answer is always, you're so lucky you're a man, you don't have to go through this. And especially when I speak to my wife about it, I'm like, well, you don't have to do it either. And it becomes a, di a discussion about, well, there's an expectation. So I only hope that if people are doing it, they're doing it because they makes them feel good. And if ever they don't have access to makeup or they're asked to go out somewhere they're not already makeup, wearing makeup, it doesn't now create stress because, oh my God, I can't go out looking like this. Mm -hmm. I think that's something we need to be very aware of in 2018, that we're not worsening the pot as far as you know, our physical expectations go. Mike, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, ever since I found out we were talking about this topic till now, I've been watching YouTube videos of men putting on makeup. I had no idea. This is great. I have this pimple situation going on right here, and I would love nothing better than to be not on live national TV with a pimple. So I'm into it. Uh, I can't wait to learn more. <laughs> Last word goes to you, Samantha. What do you think? Hey, why not? You know, women have been doing it for years and men should do it if they want to. If it's going to make them feel good, if they think they, they look better with the makeup, then absolutely wear it. Again, there is the concern about, you know, the vanity portion and having to look good all the time because of the selfie generation in which we live. But that's another story altogether. Samantha and Mike and Kenny joining us today for Culture Shock. Great to have the three of you with us. Thanks Thank for you. your time. Thank you. Thank you.